in this edition of Colores. Pulitzer Prize winning political cartoonist New Mexican Pat Oliphant shares his motivations. What you're trying to do as a cartoonist is start a conversation, plant an idea, hey, this is wrong. Scott Baxter is a photographer on a mission to document cattle ranchers and their family on ranches. As a group, they're, they're very proud of, of, their, of their heritage, they're very proud of what they do. David Krakauer makes a home among classical, funk, pop, and more. You know, playing jazz is a whole thing about originality, and it's about finding your own voice. Ori Gersh's artistic style explores life, death, violence, and beauty. I'm interested in this moment where the viewer become aware at what they're actually looking at. It's all ahead on Colores. This program is made possible in part by New Mexico Arts, a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Pat Oliphant is the most widely syndicated political cartoonist in the world, and for the last decade, he has called New Mexico home. You gotta be mad. You gotta be pissed off. Uh, you gotta bring yourself to a boil. And that's how you should feel. That's why you do this thing, because you get outraged. What you're trying to do as a cartoonist is start a conversation, plant an idea, hey, this is wrong. It's, sort of, it's a confrontational art, I suppose. You have to look for the faults in, in politicians. Of course, the, the premise is that all politicians are crooks until proved innocent. <laughs> and uh, that makes your job much easier because you're usually right. and bolts of politics just bore me to tears. It's the people involved and the, the characters uh, that fascinate me. Cartoonists need villains. Nixon's still good once a year for the cartoon. <laughs> it just keeps coming back. Until Cheney, there was nobody really like him. <laughs> uh, uh, him and Bush. You can adjust their appearance to suit what you think of them. As, uh, as in my cartoons, Bush shrank to uh, about two feet tall, and he was still towered over by a menacing Cheney. That's why they were just so so perfect. I used to really dislike Jesse Helms. I still dislike Jesse Helms, even though he's dead. And I did all sorts of as mean as I could things to him. My wife Susan had a gallery at the time in Washington where was my work was being shown. And um, two very attractive young ladies came in, said to me, we're from Senator Helms' office. And I thought, oh Christ. I said, I just wanted to tell you that Senator Helms just loves your work. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> uh, so, you, you know, as long as you spell, spell their name right, I guess that's, that's an example of it. <laughs> what I'm looking for is uh, the absurd, the uh, preposterous. <laughs> There's enough to go around. I have a lot, of, a lot of trouble with people's religion. It's one thing that will stir them up more than anything. 
embraced the religion far more than politics. The Catholic Church has been very good to me. <laughs> but I did uh, derive great satisfaction from what I drew, which is called uh, Springtime at St. Pedophilia's colon, the annual running of the altar boys, from the priests pouring out of the church and pursuing all. <laughs> Oh, it was just fun to draw, and, and so, of course, you come to the end of a cartoon, and you you uh, you know um, when it's there. Maybe it'll make you laugh yourself. Yeah. There's, a, there's just a, a satisfaction in that. My dad was a big fan. Even though my dad was like a Republican, like a, like a, was he? he was like a Goldwater Republican. Oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah well, but still. One thing about it, there's you're you're being fed plenty of material to work with. There's no shortage. Of, oh yeah, it's uh, constantly <laughs> write their own stuff and I illustrate it. That's right. It? <laughs> I love the Dick Cheney and the horse. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No matter which side you're on, you know. It's, uh, it didn't make a bit of difference. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 we're running out of oxygen in here. Great. After all this, <laughs> well, you get to leave. Yeah, I, I could be in the studio. <laughs> Thanks for entertaining me. <laughs> you, you dog. I should say you bad dog. You my wife, baby. So I suppose, in, in, in effect, I've always drawn. My dad was a draftsman for the, gov the government, and uh, he had access to all sorts of paper. So I had an everlasting supply of, <laughs> of art materials. So I've done it ever since. Publicly, you tend to get pigeonholed into being, oh, he's a cartoonist. Uh, I, I can't let that bother me. I'm just, I just go on from one thing to the other and uh, you'll paint for a month and then you'll paint, you'll sculpt and then you'll, you'll, you just keep moving around. It shouldn't be anchored to caricatures of people of, 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 of today. It shouldn't matter in a hundred years. The present day has to be transcended by the art itself. I think I just want to leave something of beauty and uh, perhaps an honesty. And this one lifetime isn't enough, if you know what I mean. For most of the last decade, Scott Baxter has photographed over 100 cattle ranchers and their family on ranches. He's found a way of preserving the centuries-old traditions of America's true cowboys. Some of these ranches that we're photographing aren't going to be around because, uh, you know, development's going to find it, you know, its way in. And, and there's a lot of ranches I know that there's no one coming up behind them, so they'll most likely be sold. And I just thought, what if photographically I could at least try to record some of these families that have been around here since, you know, since 1912 or earlier. And that's, it kind of started that way. I didn't really plan to do anything with it. I just wanted to see if I could accomplish it. We call it 100 years, 100 ranchers. And basically the criteria is, the family has been ranching in Arizona continuously since 1912 or earlier. My ancestors came here from Valencia, Spain in the 1840s, and they were coming to Tucson by covered wagon. This is the uh, Amado family, my great-grandfather. About 1852 is when they set up the ranch at Alamo Bonito in what is called Amado. This family is very historic family, goes back a long ways, and a beautiful ranch too. And one of my uh, 
Santa Cruz County is probably one of my favorite places to be in the whole state. Photographs should be really easy for you to look at. You know, it doesn't mean it has to be Pollyannish or, you know, beautiful or anything. It just has to be easy. And if it's easy, it's good. And then, uh, Henry, just kind of right in the middle. If I push too hard, if I really try too hard to push a photograph, it just doesn't work out for me. I kind of let the photograph come to me. There's not a set process. I want to get this side too because it's got your brand on the horse's shoulder. I have, you know, aside from scouting a little bit the day before and knowing I wanted to use that big sycamore tree, I don't, there's not a, you know, I don't have like a list of what I'm going to do. I just kind of walk in and, and it's kind of the way I've always worked. I just kind of wing it and, and uh, it kind of works for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but it works for me. Perfect, guys. Okay. The last one with this camera for now, at least. I was standing there. Okay, straight in. Last evening by the tree with uh, between two horses and okay, with my son and grandson on each side of me. Very proud. It just gives you an idea. It's a small shot. Now you got to kind of look at it. But you want to show that pride. I mean, they're very, as a group, they're they're very proud of, of their of their heritage. They're very proud of what they do. So that's kind of where we're at. So we're gonna we're gonna shoot a few more with this camera. With the portraits, you just kind of, you know, you kind of take a little more time and kind of get your frame up the way you want it, and then you, you know, you read your light and you shoot it. Five, six, one, twenty-five. Well, I think it's a wonderful thing that. That, that Scott came up with this idea. But this is actually very nice where we're at now. It's recorded history. I don't think they're really looking for recognition, but I think they like the fact that there's going to be a record of this somewhere for, you know, for their kids. I treated this in a lot of ways just like it could have been shot, you know, 100 years ago. I bring a digital with me, but that's just to shoot stuff for them. But we're shooting just straight black and white film, no lights. So it's basically camera film and a tripod. And that kind of forces me to really think about my composition a lot, because I don't have a lot of tricks in my bag. And it kind of makes you think a little bit more as a photographer. I don't know of any rancher that doesn't work hard. They have to. No, I don't have to do this. I've always uh, been a very successful CPA, and uh, with my son as my partner, the business is still going, and maybe that's why I can afford to be here, because uh, if he's there, I don't have to be at the office, but uh, I enjoy being here, and at my age, I deserve to be here. I think it's uh, love of the ranch, love, the lo love of the land. The brandings are, are, can be kind of exciting. You got two guys roping and, and dragging calves, and you got three or four cowboys stowing calves on the ground. And sometimes with the action stuff, I don't really have time to do too much, but just kind of hang in there. You don't want to be the cause of somebody getting hurt. Um, you don't want to be the cause of livestock getting injured. And, and you certainly don't want to get hurt yourself. So. You stay dialed into the frame, but but you certainly kind of have to you have to have a few things going on in your head at the same time and, and keep yourself uh, cognizant of of really what's going on around you. Now this one is a little bit more. This is like the old style. This takes. No, it won't, it won't, won't blow up. Yeah, I've not had a bad experience, and I've got a story for every single ranch that I've been at. That's perfect, right there. Hold that. You know, the photographs are kind of the icing on the cake, but, but the real thing is, I, I just... Thank you, sir. It's in. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, they're a great group of people, and I, I've just been real honored to, to have the opportunity to meet them and spend some time with them. They're all hardworking. They're just hardworking people who just like, they, they love what they do. You know, and they really love the land. I mean, that's, that's the thing that I've kind of come away with, is they, are re they really love this land, and they really want to take care of it. David Krakauer is a world-class clarinetist, known for the intensity with which he interprets a wide range of musical genres. If I look back and think about the things that I've uh, been most proud of and most excited about, I have to say that's finding my individual voice on the clarinet. 
where you can drop the needle, so to speak, and you can say, oh, that's, that's David Krakauer. I recognize that sound. I played the piano when I was five, but it didn't catch. So when I was 10 years old, I had a chance to study an instrument. And my mother, you know, being a violinist who had started at age three, she said, well, you're 10 years old and you're way too old to play the violin. And so she said, well, how about the clarinet or the flute? And she said it in that order. So I chose the clarinet. When I was about 11 years old, I received a present from my parents, a record of Sidney Bechet, of the great New Orleans jazz clarinetist and soprano saxophonist. And you know, while I had heard music growing up, I took it for granted a little bit. But when I heard Sidney Bechet, I, I kind of sort of connected the dots. I was able to say, oh, this is what music can do. Music can communicate on this level. So he kind of became my, my teacher who I had never met. Through high school, I was playing jazz and classical at the same time. And then musicians who knew me were saying, you should focus on classical because you're like all over the place. And I was also feeling like, um, you know, playing jazz is a whole thing about originality, and it's about finding your own voice. So I started getting these big doubts when I was in my early 20s. So basically, I, I stopped playing jazz, and I said, okay, I'm gonna focus on classical music. But sort of secretly, I was experimenting with weird sounds on the clarinet and sort of weird kind of avant-garde improvising. And then when I was in my early 30s, I began to feel like that somehow I had thrown the baby out with the bathwater by abandoning jazz. I started checking out different kinds of music. But it really wasn't until about 1987 that I actually got into Klezmer. And how it happened was I used to live on 80th Street and Broadway, right across from Zabar's. And in front of Zabar's, there was a small Klezmer band. And several months later, I was on the 104 bus in New York City, and this woman walks in the door, and I said, oh, wow, you're the accordion player in that klezmer band in front of Zabar's. And she said, you know, um, our clarinetist is leaving, and we're looking for a clarinet player. And the words just came out of my mouth, like, I'd like to try. It was a real defining moment for me, because suddenly it became clear to me that this is my past, this is my parents, this is my grandparents, this is my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents. It's deep, deep, deep roots. And then suddenly, a band called the Klezmatics heard about me, and they invited me to come and play with them in Europe. I was very drawn to them because the Klezmatics took a very anti-nostalgia kind of attitude. And so it was like, we're making new music. We're relating more to pop and somewhat to jazz and to rock and to funk. And suddenly all these little experiments that I was doing quietly started seeping into klezmer music. So this whole search that I had had my whole life and maybe 10 years of frustration, finally in the late 80s, I was starting to, you know, find a musical home. Another important collaboration is with a young Canadian beat architect and producer, and his nom de plume is So Called. And So Called and I met at a Klezmer festival called Klez Canada up near Montreal. And So Called brought me this CD that he had basically made in his home studio, and it was called The Hip Hop Seder. And it was absolutely brilliant. 
he found this beautiful mix of samples of old Yiddish theater and klezmer and uh, Hasidic nigunim. And so I asked him to be uh, a featured artist with my band, Klezmer Madness. And then So Called said, what about Fred Wesley? Fred Wesley was James Brown's trombonist and arranger from the late 60s, early 70s, doing horn arrangements with Parliament Funkadelic. One could argue that he almost created funk. And so we contacted Fred, and then so we were in a room together, so-called hit one of his beats for this tune called Balabusta. And, um, Fred started improvising, I started improvising with him, and we knew suddenly we had chemistry. We formed a real band, which we call Abraham Incorporated, because obviously Abraham is a kind of a great figure for Jews, for Christians, for Muslims, is sort of a great unifying father figure. Basically, my life is traveling internationally, touring, uh, playing lots of concerts, and then coming back and just teaching wall to wall. So it, it's quite, uh, quite intense, quite intense, but I just love it. In the midst of conflict, one painter finds inspiration. Israeli artist Ori Gersh creates vibrant paintings highlighting beauty among destruction. At first blush, the works of Israeli artist Ori Gersh are pieces of painstaking beauty, an elegant cherry tree branch, a verdant Spanish landscape, and a traditional still life. It's seductive. Beauty is what pulls us all into this work. We can't help ourselves. But it's also, it's like a little lullaby. It sort of lures you in, but then when you least expect it, he does bring in comments about violence. The cherry tree branch is actually a photograph of a tree growing in Hiroshima's irradiated soil. Look more closely at the landscape, and you'll find the carcass of a dead dog. In the still life of the flower arrangement, it is soon lifeless. It is all painstaking work imbued with pain, says curator Al Minor. There have been four wars in Israel since Ori was born. His whole life has been in the middle of an ethnic conflict. He's been a witness to so many moments in that nation situation. It's hard for us, I think, as Americans to understand what it would be like to live in a place where so much history is embedded in everything and violence really is around every single corner. Ori Gerst, history repeating, is a vastly intriguing and revelatory perspective. It's the first comprehensive museum survey for Gerst, featuring 17 photographs and eight films dating to 1998. What I'm interested in is the kind of tension that exists between attraction and repulsion. In his photographs, it's a more quiet tension, a sadness brought on by sudden understanding. Much like the cherry blossom, his landscapes, while gorgeous, are pointed. The serene lake in Boatman was actually a hiding place for Jews during World War II. Same for this spot in the Pyrenees. It's something you can only learn by reading the wall text. I'm interested in this moment where the viewer become aware at what they're actually looking at and the effect that it has on them. From the moment the words are becoming into the equation, the experience can never return to its pure, almost this innocent initial relationship between the eye and the image. Gerst's moving images force a more direct response. In this play on an 18th century French painting, the bird suddenly drops into an abyss. A coin and its history harshly melt away. And in Hebrew, the word for pomegranate is the same as grenade. We see that disturbing definition unfold. You know, cells in our body are constantly dying and new cells are emerging. 
And so sometimes we'll have personal experiences that will have great effect on us. And the, 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 the shift between feeling untouchable and feeling incredibly vulnerable and hopeless are uh, so fine. In all of Gerst's work, in the obvious and in the more ambiguous, he hearkens back to the old masters. Their DNA is part of his own, he believes. It's a questioning of the past in terms of what were these artists doing? What were these moments in history? Why were they important? Why did they create the ripples through time that they did? But it's also an admiration. They rendered life. Now Gerst adds a voice. Next time on Colores. New Mexican Pueblo artist Diego Romero mixes traditional pottery with pop culture. Humor is medicine. Once we lose the ability to laugh at ourselves and the world around us, we lose the ability to heal. Oleg Vasiliev shows us Soviet nonconformist art. Art is very important. Art is great. There is something that is bigger than art. Airport designed for more than transportation. Art and architecture matter, and it affects your life. John Sayles talks about his latest book and film. Really what I think more about rather than a legacy is mostly about the cultural conversation of the moment. Until next time, thank you for watching.